The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on Business Best tonight. This is a platform where we showcase the best in the business. We will be introducing to you people who have excelled in their particular field in order to showcase their latest developments in their respective industry. So today on the show we have a pioneer in the field of education and the man behind it all. He has over 30 years of experience in the health industry and over 15 years of experience in the education industry. He's an experienced medical administrator in the government and private sector as well. In addition to being a medical doctor, he has a postgraduate qualification in health and administration. For over a decade of being an academic and certified master trainer in Australia and an eminent researcher who has published many articles and also contributed to several local and international conferences regarding ed education and health. And he is also an honorary faculty member of many UK and Malaysian universities. He has pioneered the development of a regional learning center for international universities in Sri Lanka and currently he heads the innovative organization known Known as the International Institute of Health Science, also known as the IIHS. His vision has led this organization to become the leader in healthcare education organization and delivering from diploma level to doctorate level. And it is my pleasure to welcome the CEO, co-founder, director academic strategy and international affairs at IIHS, Dr. Kitsiri Edrisinger. Doctor, thank you very much for joining here with us on Business Best tonight. It's a pleasure being here. Doctor, my first question to you uh, is completely out of curiosity. How do you see your career change from health administration to education and training? It's an in interesting uh, change, a transformation that I had. Uh, when I started my career uh, uh, as a medical doctor, and uh, last two decades I moved into education, how it happened was like uh, I studied from at St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia, then moved into North Columbia Medical College. And my postgraduate qualification was from uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine under uh, Colombo University. Uh, and I was uh, privileged to have uh, many professionals and top-end academics supporting me, giving me the tools uh, to work uh, professionally. So when I moved into a rural area as a medical doctor, uh, working with uh, only bare hands, uh, no investigations, no nurses, no telephone, uh, no ambulances. So it was working with uh, very scarce resources. So that initial training gave me an understanding of how to use uh, scarce resources and work efficiently. Because you at the end of the day, you're working with, uh, dealing with patients. So not only that, these professionals uh, gave me wisdom. That wisdom was not only to work efficiently, but they always think outside the box. Uh, so I not only think outside the box, I have, I have, bro have broken the box many times. So I was in the government sector, uh, rising uh, as a medical administrator. Then I thought, uh, there's more in me to add value to the society. Then I moved into the private sector. And uh, I, I, when I left that private sector organization, I built up a chain of hospitals. Uh, and then, then I saw an opportunity for training, especially for nurses. Then I moved into nurses training uh, small school, uh, which we developed over last uh, 15 years up to an international level. So in addition to this, uh, I always believe that foundation to any development of uh, any country is education. And then uh, by educating youth, you can change the whole uh, generations. So that's, that's one of the things, uh, one challenge that I had. Second thing was to make change. So those are the components for me to move, transform from a medical career to education. Okay, doctor. So do you think that the decision that you made was one of the best decisions that you made in your life? Absolutely. That okay. has given me not only uh, pleasure working with young kids and then I said professionals, uh, see them transforming, see them doing better 
in their own lives as adding value to the society was one of my great dreams. That's great to hear, Doctor, because it's inspiring to hear that you're working on something that you're really interested in and something that you're really passionate about. So now moving on to the subject of uh, private institutes, would you like to share your thoughts on the role of what private institutes play at the moment uh, considering the Sri Lankan education industry? In uh, private, uh, it's an interesting uh, area and also, of course, a challenging area because this education mimics a public good. Uh, public good is generally uh, an essential services and it is uh, in traditionally it is controlled and uh, service uh, services are delivered by the respective governments so the main service provider the funder as well as the controller the regulator is the government uh, so that has been the developing country that has been the norm uh, in sri lanka if you look at it uh, just uh, on addition to that, they will give free at the point of delivery. The government will provide free services at the point of delivery. On top of that, they would also subsidize some of the private institutions under their belt, uh, giving subsidized education. So in terms of a private investor coming into the education arena, it is indeed a challenging uh, environment because your major competitor is the government. Exactly. Uh, again, when comparing government institutes and private institutes, do you see like a significant difference of their education methods or systems with each other? Uh, well, it's, a, it's an important question. Uh, if you really look at uh, how this uh, differentiation occurs, uh, our South Asian system, education systems are uh, built on using scarce resources. If you have more uh, services, uh, if you have more funding available, the system will be better. So uh, if you really look at our system, our uh, GDP percentage uh, per uh, expenditure on education about 2.75. That's an average. That amounts to about 80,000 rupees per student. We have uh, 5 billion students, roughly approximately 5 million students, starting from uh, preschool right up to the uh, advanced level and then the higher education. Uh, but the issue is, uh, because of the scarcity of the resources, it is very competitive in the state sector. So therefore, uh, starting from 500,000 preschool kids, when they move out, you have only 300,000 sitting for the advanced level exam. So what happens is from that 300,000, there's only about 15% will, uh, will be selected to the state universities because the lack of uh, resources, because only the cream could go into that. So the whole system is very competitive and also it excludes many from the system. So what is going to happen to this uh, ex excluded or dropouts, if, if some, some people may say. So that is the uh, market the, uh, that private sector has. So currently government sector approximately uh, training about 70,000 higher education uh, students and equally private sector is doing about 70,000. So there is, a, there is a sufficient space for the private sector to play. Okay, Doctor. Now, considering the sustainability, of course, any business would do a business forecast, and but not 100% that the forecast will be accurate. So this market and economy can be unstable at any point. What is the advice that you can give for an organization in the education industry to survive in this unstable market economy? Well, uh, now, uh, education, as I told you, uh, it's a more socialistic entity. Uh, in uh, especially in the developing countries. So the, your, you have to put your strategy, your descriptive plan in front of before p &L. If you, that's how it, you have to really look at the market uh, areas, the demand, the industry need. That's important to look at. Now I yeah, just looked at nursing. So nobody has ever thought of uh, training nurses. But we've looked at the global demand as well as the local demand. Then we started doing, looking at it. Then you put your, uh, your, all your strength together and then detail out the plans. So typically what happens in a business is you have a, an excellent uh, strategic plan, but you miss out certain tasks so that finally file an outcome is not be the way that you wanted to happen. So therefore detailing out, going to detail is very important. Then moving into 
the looking at uh, how how you can sustain your business. So a lot of common sense is needed and perseverance. As Sri Lankans, what I have seen uh, in business world and the industry is that our perseverance is less. We easily give up things. So that's staying at one with your strategy, a detailed plan, and moving towards that is that is that amounts to sustainability and of course the uh, profits of the business. Right. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing your experience, knowledge on this side of uh, business. So we'll have to go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon on the other side. We are in discussion with Dr. Keith Siri Edith Singer. Welcome back to Business Best and we are in discussion with the CEO and founder of the IIHS Institute, Dr. Kitsiri Edrisinger. Doctor, you definitely um, explained to us about your expertise knowledge on this education industry. Now coming back to your institute, IIHS, uh, I believe that you provide an international program as well and it's known to be a little bit costly and effective and it has also been very difficult to deliver. How do you manage this? Uh, well, uh, uh, delivering international programs is a challenge uh, simply because there are two factors. Number one, uh, maintaining the quality. Second one, making it affordable uh, to locals. So what we did was, it uh, di didn't happen overnight. Uh, so in terms of the quality, we put up our systems as per the international standards. Not only educational standards. Since we are in health, we'll have to abide by the uh, professional standards because these kids will go out of the country and work in uh, respective nursing or other uh, healthcare environments. So there are professional bodies regulating this industry. So they generally what happens is uh, they do a thorough audit before they come to an agreement on a particular program and then semester-wise there are uh, quality audits and annual there are physical audits. So that that is one of the things that uh, you have to really look at and then the systems, training staff, putting up system, a use of a latest technology, uh, your real time to, to get the absorb the other uh, knowledge around uh, what you have with your partners. That Then the secondly, what we did was of making affordable. So we created a platform called International University Learning Center where we approached this in two uh, segments. One is that we deliver three-year diplomas where the final year they can either go to Finland, UK or in Australia. So that way we cut down 60% of the cost. So typical program would be about 10,000 US dollars. You cut off around 60,000 US dollars. This is excluding the food and lodging for uh, three years. So you have to spend only one year's cost and the other costs are very affordable in Sri Lanka. Secondly, we deliver the total program in Sri Lanka, like a trans transnational education systems. So, for example, the Coventry University top up bachelors for nurses, it is about 8 million in Coventry. Here we deliver at media 7 lakhs, one tenth of the cost, but exactly the same program, exactly the same outcome, uh, and then uh, a same experience we'll try to mimic. So, therefore, those are the uh, positives that came out from delivering international programs. Uh, doctor, you mentioned about some uh, professionalism and the standards that you have brought, in, brought into this international program. Are there any international bodies that you have partnered with in order to get this international standard? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, we work with a uh, few universities in uh, UK, Australia, Finland and Malaysia. Uh, starting from Malaysia, where we have Open University Malaysia uh, and then uh, in Australia, Deakin University uh, and then uh, James Cook University are the ones that we closely work with. And in Finland, uh, Allied Health Sciences, Metropolia Health Sciences uh, University. And in UK, Coventry University UK and University of Aberdeen, that is a uh, second or fourth rank for medicine and uh, Coventry it's for fourth rank for nursing. So those are fairly uh, highly recognized uh, universities. And uh, these partnerships are well over 10 years. So it takes time uh, to understand them and then we work with uh, the best simply because we want the best for our students. 
Okay, Doctor. Now, uh, touching up on the phenomenal crisis that the whole world is facing at the moment and all of the businesses and every individual was affected by this as well, even the education industry. So how do you see this change happening? I'm pretty sure you all had to move into online classes and online lecturing. How do you see that effective or not? How are you carrying out your educational programs at the moment? Yeah, yeah the COVID uh, gives you unpleasant uh, feeling always. But I'm going to talk about something positive from COVID. Uh, co tradi traditional education systems always resisted online or e-learning uh, using any technology, any form. That has been a, this thing in developing countries. What happened was because of COVID, by default, we'll have to abide by this. We have to use e-learning and uh, learner management systems. For IIHS, we have put up our systems almost eight years ago thanks to our partners, partner universities. So when COVID came, it was just a matter of uh, repla replacing the face-to-face -face interactions with uh, using Zoom or Windows. Uh, so therefore, for us, uh, we have won many awards for this from Commonwealth uh, Awards for this consecutively. And uh, the systems are very efficient. So be simply because uh, you cut down the cost. Now, for example, uh, the, we have about uh, 2,000 government nurses studying with us and all of them are using a tab. Not a single book is used. So therefore that cut down a lot of cost in terms of the student as well as for the organization. And uh, the accessibility, you can study at any time, anywhere and at your own pace. Because they can be synchronized lectures, that is live lectures, or you can record it and play it, unsynchronized lectures. So you can do your things at your own pace. That's very important, for especially for professionals. And then, and sustainability. So we, you don't uh, print papers, because and then the mobility, especially with this, the cut down a lot of costs for even pro our staff and the other professionals, because it's, it's quite uh, remarkable, really using e-platforms. And then you have the accessibility to world-class professionals. You can listen to a lecture from Deakin or any other university live, or synchronously and synchronized lectures. Uh, likewise, you have the access accessibility to world's top journals, books. So, in future, with this, lot of physical uh, entities will uh, will be uh, uh, will dissolved. Uh, for example, library. Libraries are all digital now. Uh, so you might have a digital. Uh, you must have a physical library, uh, just as a as a monument in years to come. Right, Doctor. Uh, now, something about we would like to know your expertise knowledge on this. When an individual or a student has to choose their career path, what is the advice that you can give for a parent in order to look for when uh, selecting a university or the path that their child should follow? Yes, it's, it's a very good question because it's a milestone of a, a one youth career. No? So what we do is uh, generally uh, we would advise parents uh, to look at the sustainability of jobs because the world is changing very rapidly so therefore the jobs are also job market also changing you have to really look at the uh, next 15 years what are the top jobs and at least uh, for you to graduate your kid to graduate and uh, take up a degree and then uh, take up a job would take about at least five years so if you really look at IIHS all our programs are sustainable because, because top 10 uh, uh, next 10 years, top 10 jobs are within those are the programs that we do in order to sustain uh, the jobs and uh, to achieve the success by the respective uh, professional personnel. And then uh, secondly, they'll have to look at a program to match that. If you are going out of the country, you have to take a program, select a program which would give you a certain job recognition. Then an organization with a history because the, you can't do it overnight, these things. You know, it, it takes time. And their, their performance. Now, we have uh, graduated over 2,000 nurses and uh, professionals. And also, we have uh, about 500 uh, students, are graduates are working all over the world. Right? Those are the, the, those are the, ex the experience that we had. Then, uh, parents will have to really look at uh, the, what is the, uh, the safety of the job. Uh, the respect of the job because Asian countries you will have to have a respectable job Definitely. you know and then most important thing is a comfortable 
whether it's comfortable to them. That means in terms of the economic gains, what are the job, what are the salaries? So our, our programs, what we do, the outcome is at 24 years, you can earn nearly um, uh, five to uh, eight lakhs per month. So when you spend certain amount of funding for education, what is the return on investment that you get? That are, those are the things that I think uh, parents should look at. Oh, thank you, Doctor, for that advice. I believe that our audience will have something great to take away from this conversation. My next question for you, Doctor, where do you see IIHS in the future? What's your final vision? Well, our vision is to transform people, community and the landscape through innovation. So if we, uh, if we transform this uh, co community, the youth, then they will add value to the community. Our landscape of Sri Lanka would be different. Our image, currently we are, we are branded as a country which uh, export uh, housemates. That's uh, number one or two uh, foreign exchange that we get. We have to change this because we have the highest literacy in the, in the, in the region. So we wanted to move this to a country which exports highly skilled nurses from this country. Uh, that's one of the areas that we look at. In order to do that, we have to align with what the government wants. Private sector cannot work, uh, play a solo game because you are in the macro picture with the government. So government vision is to create a knowledge-based economy. So we have uh, organized uh, two areas to move forward. We are, uh, we, are, uh, we are going to initiate a program, uh, project called uh, Multiversity. Many universities are under one belt. With a re we have to not only to export uh, our uh, skill labor, but also to attract students to this country as the education exports. Uh, secondly, we'll be moving into a um, A-level segment by uh, 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 introducing uh, Western Australian uh, education system uh, starting with advanced level. The concept is called Western Australian uh, International School uh, and they, this, the, this is the, in partnership with the Western Australian Education uh, Ministry. I think uh, there is a segment that we, we have to improve our A-level uh, uh, education. So we are going to add value to that segment as well. Thank you, Doctor. And also, time is very critical now in this show. As my final question, is there any advice that you can give to our young entrepreneurs at this moment? Because definitely the whole world is facing a crisis point at uh, this moment. So is it advisable for any one of us to start a business? What's your advice for them? Definitely yes. Absolutely yes. But there are enough gaps in the market. So you have to do studies. When you have an idea, it doesn't uh, to make it to practice. You have to study a little it's more. Study in the industry and see the industry demand. And then uh, put up a plan, as I told you before. And then uh, detail it out. Uh, stick with your plan. And uh, um, perseverance is the key to success. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much for that advice. And thank you again for joining here with us on uh, Business Best. And I wish you all the best. And I hope IIHS gets to achieve that final vision of yours. Thank you so much. Well, that was our episode today on Business Best. We will be back again next week, same time, same place, Fridays at 7 p.m. But don't go anywhere because a Blueprint is up next. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Have a great night. <laughs>